Welcome to Sarder TV. I'm Jennifer Crumpton, and today I have the pleasure of talking with Dolly Chug. She is the Associate Professor of Management and Organizations at NYU's Stern School of Business. Dolly, thank you so much for being here with thank us today. Thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here, Jennifer. Thanks. I'm curious to know, as a very beloved professor at NYU, oh as I have heard, don't try to deny it, <laughs> what advice do you give to young people who are entering today's oh. business world? Oh, gosh. I end my course every year begging them to hold on to their humanity, mm. to fight for their humanity. Wow. We talk about how they started when they came to Stern, their first day. They were these three-dimensional people. They had passions, they had interests, they had fears. They had a view of the world and the role they wanted to play in it. And that humanity, what we want to do is help them expand it and take it into the business world, not constrain it. But you know what, sometimes it looks like the business world is trying to constrain your humanity, mm. make you care about fewer things, monetary things only, only yourself. That's not how our students come to us, and I hope when they leave us, they go out with all the humanity they came in with and more. So I beg them to fight for their humanity every step of their career. I also hope they will follow the advice of Silas House, who's a wonderful author and social commentator. He has this great approach, which is be revolutionary every day. Hmm. Be revolutionary every day. Whether you're an investment banker or a social activist, whether you're a stay-at-home parent or whether you're a CEO, be revolutionary every day. Find a way to get better. Find a way to make everyone else better. Find a way to make everything around you better. Hmm. That's what being revolutionary every day is about. So before becoming a professor, you worked for several different right. really large organizations like Morgan Stanley and Time Inc. and Scholastic. I'm curious, while you were in the business world, yes. what were some of the biggest organizational challenges that you saw? Yeah. And how did that get you thinking about being a professor? Yeah. One of the things, I don't know if we would call it a challenge or even an opportunity, I was amazed as a young person to notice how differently people reacted to their bosses. Hmm. There were bosses people would walk through fire for. Like it was clear from the first day on the job. They said, go work for Linda Warren at Sports Illustrated and she will walk through fire for you and you will walk through fire for her. And everything I saw suggested that was true. And then there were other bosses, well-intended bosses, you know, doing a fine job and there were bosses who were not the best bosses, for whom they didn't have quite that level of personal loyalty from their employees. And that just amazed me. That amazed me that in the workplace, in something that's in theory just a job, you could evoke such different reactions in the people um, in the organization. And it really came down to that boss and what they did and felt and offered and understood about the people working for them. It was so powerful. A great boss, I truly believe, can change the world. Mm. They certainly change the lives of the people who work for them. Like a great manager is an important activist in making the world a better place. That's a great way to look at it. Yeah. By the way, Linda Warren, the senior leader at Sports Illustrated that I just mentioned actually went on to become a minister. Did she, she really? She did. I'm not in touch with her anymore, but that, that was, she ended up leaving. She was an extremely senior person. She changed a lot of lives as a senior manager. And then she decided to just take it into a different context. Interesting. Into a more spiritual context. And yeah. so, what an amazing example of how, for her, it was the same skills and same outlook, just in a different context. What do you think makes a great leader? What I love about um, the people I've observed who are great leaders is how different they are. I don't think there's one mold. There's the extroverted, charismatic mold. There's the introverted, very quiet, very, very sort of spiritual mode. So I don't think we have to look for sort of the prototype of what makes a great leader, but the leaders that people will walk through fire for understand who their employees are. They mm. really do understand their team and they really do understand what each person needs. Some people need 
validation. Some people need you to create space for their personal life. Some people need you to help them advance their careers. And I think the bosses that understand people as individuals get a lot of loyalty from those individuals. You're a proponent of education reform. Mm -hmm. What type of education reform do you think we should be engaging right. in the United States and why is this so important? Right. The way I think about education reform is simply as creating a system where all kids in our country are getting a quality education. And in some cases that requires reform and in some cases it doesn't. We have incredibly talented teachers. We have incredibly dedicated professionals in the teaching profession. But we also have some really systemic problems in terms of how schools are funded, in terms of the sort of ability of the leader of a school to truly lead that school, to select the talent, match the talent, and um, when necessary, move talent, they're really limited in a lot of ways. And what I would love to see is a system where, whether it's in our current delivery system of public schools, whether it's in the charter schools that we're seeing that are experimenting with different modes of delivery, whether it's in online education, the goal is to make sure every child in this country gets a quality education, especially the children living in poverty. Mm -hmm. That's where the education can make the most difference, mm. and that's where we see the least access, the least quality, and the least support for those kids. We see if you're in the lower quartile of income in this country, if you're a child, you have an 8% chance of going to college. If you're in the top quartile, you have an 85% chance of going to college. Those children are not 10 times smarter in the top quartile than the bottom mm, quartile. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of really great people, whether they're, they consider themselves reformers or whether they consider themselves traditionalists in education. What I'm hoping we're pushing for is creating access for every kid. Out of curiosity, I feel like this will be a really big debate in the upcoming yeah. 2016 election. Is there mm -hmm. anything that you're hoping to hear from candidate? There's a lot of emotional charge around things like school choice, around vouchers, around um, teacher unions. And what's challenging is that each political party has a history on those issues that sort of is anchoring them. What I would love mm. to see is our political our parties being willing to let go of the historical anchors of their party a little bit. Mm. So. Cory Booker, I think, offers, a senator from New Jersey, mm -hmm. offers a great example of being willing to look beyond partisan politics when it comes to quality education. And yeah. I think he sets a good example for what, what other politicians might want to consider. You advocate leadership training for teachers. Why? Yeah. And, and what does this entail? What does this look like? Right. Yeah, what I'm involved in, and I can't take the credit for this, actually, I do work with a charter school network called the KIPP. They're, um, I believe, uh, the largest or amongst the largest charter school networks in the United States. They have over 140 schools across the country. And the founders, Dave Levin and Mike Feinberg, um, have had a tremendous impact on the number of kids going to college, to and through college, from that bottom quartile, from low-income neighborhoods where access to higher education has been a challenge historically. What they have taught me is the importance of strong leadership in schools to create the kinds of schools that can help kids who are coming from environments where quality education hasn't been available, to bring kids who are three grade levels behind in a subject up to grade level and beyond, get them into college and get them through college, mm. even once they've left the KIPP schools. You require the highest quality school, which means it requires the highest quality school leadership. Mm. And so in learning from them and in working with them as a member of their team that teaches the school leadership program they have over the summer, I work with several other business school professors and we put on a one week curriculum for the principals of those schools, the assistant principals, and the pipeline of school leadership. They might be grade level chairs, they might be curriculum like a subject level chair, they might be a, a dean of students at, at a KIPP school. 
And they come together from all over the country for one week in Chicago, and we immerse them in a week of leadership training. Mm -hmm. Now, most of them are not completely in a teacher role. They are taking on these additional leadership responsibilities. So that's where my point of contact is, is the leadership training for teachers who are also taking on these additional responsibilities as school leaders. Um, it has a tremendous impact. The, the schools where the school leaders are in place and are performing at a high level see higher levels of attendance, see higher levels of graduation, see higher levels of college matriculation. So the leader of a school, we can think of them as they're essentially a teacher of the adults in the school. They're helping every teacher in that school grow and be as high performing as they can be, which in turn helps the children grow and be as high performing as they can be. So what we do when we think about school leaders and leadership training is we're not thinking of them as administrators and bureaucrats. We're thinking of them as growers of adults and children, which is what leaders are in businesses as well. Right. There's such a parallel yes. that I hear as yes. you talk about this, yes. leading a team to a goal and yes. taking all the different personalities and learning styles yes. and, and getting people to a certain point. That's Absolutely. really interesting to apply to education. Absolutely. And there's certainly no premise that education is a business. It's We're not treating them as business people. It's far more complex than a business. What a school principal is trying to do is more challenging that, than any CEO in a company is mm. facing, the stakeholders, the parents, the children, the circumstances they can't control. It is such a challenge mm. school leaders face. It is the hardest job. I love working with them. I would never want their job. It would <laughs> terrify me. I have, I'm in such awe of what they do. What I've learned from the, I don't know how many of them I've worked with now, maybe almost a thousand we're coming up on. Mm. What I keep learning from them is that they are modeling learning and growing themselves. They're setting that mindset so it flows throughout the building. So there are no excuses for not learning. There are no excuses for not growing. There are not, no excuses for not getting up when we fail. They're modeling it so the adults and the kids can keep doing it under really challenging circumstances. Dolly, you talk a lot about the concept of bounded awareness yes. and how decisions can be influenced. Talk to us about what bounded awareness is and, and what these decision-making issues are that yeah, come up. Absolutely. So the easiest way to think of bounded awareness, it's that moment we experience when we're looking for the butter in the fridge and we claim there is no butter in the fridge and we <laughs> insist that we looked and there really was no butter in the fridge and then our family member comes and says, there's the butter in the fridge. <laughs> and we say, how did I miss that? How did I not see it right in front of me? That how did I miss that kind of captures the phenomena of bounded awareness. We think of it as our, when we fail to see or seek out relevant information, that's an example of bounded awareness. And it's both visually, it's both a visual phenomena of us literally not seeing something in front of us, not processing it, as well as a psychological phenomena, the idea that we tend to reach conclusions even when information that would be useful is available to us or could be sought by us and we're mm. not going after it. Okay. Um, so it's first a failure to see and then sometimes it's also a failure to seek. Those are the two decision-making ah. variants of it. And I was actually just today uh, meeting with a wonderful scholar at the Columbia Business School, Ting Zhang, uh, who just graduated from the Harvard Business School. and she. She was telling me about some great studies they're running that tie to bounded awareness where they are giving people sort of a simulation of the Bernie Madoff scheme, huh. right? But they don't tell people that's what it is. And they give people an opportunity to seek out more information to, to validate whether this is right or not. And people tend not to. They tend to accept it. And uh, the simulation they do is really cool and really robust. They actually have a hard time de-biasing people, meaning getting people to go beyond what's just in front of them, the data they've given them. So there is this, this strong tendency we have to sit with what's in front of us, to not step back and say, huh, wait, what else is around me? What's not in my field of vision? What's not in my field of reference? And it's a completely human tendency. It's hmm. not that some people do this and some people don't. We, we are all subject to this. The boundedness and bounded awareness 
is speaking about the human brain, not about certain subsets of people. We are what we call um, system one thinkers. So mm. there's this distinction between system one thinking, which is our fast, reflexive, automatic thinking, and system two thinking, which is our slower, deliberative. And that um, Daniel Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize in economics, made that distinction. And in his bestseller, Thinking Fast and Slow, he says we're doing both at the same time. We're thinking fast, system one, and we're thinking slow, slow and deliberative. Both sets of processes sit in the same brain. Bounded awareness is, is largely a system one process, the way we originally conceptualized it. And sometimes we have to pull ourselves out of the quick automatic way of thinking and pull back. So we're not lazy, we're just doing what the human brain does, which mm. is operate in both modes, thinking fast and thinking slow. Do you think slow. technology exacerbates oh, it? Oh, it might. <laughs> I know with me, it's sort of crazy the number of times I find myself missing things <laughs> and there are those great videos you see of um, people who when we're, when we're on our phones like I think these videos of like a guy sitting at a bar and then somebody comes and holds up the bar right and he like misses and you miss he it. actually doesn't see it because he's texting the whole time yeah. and the, you know the whole thing is over before he notices <laughs> those would be great examples of bounded awareness Talk to us about bounded ethicality. Mm -hmm. What is that and how does it affect people? Yeah, so maybe I can actually give a little context on where it came from. So there's a concept, bounded rationality, which is fairly well known in the social sciences. And it was coined by Herb Simon, who won a Nobel Prize. And what he was describing with bounded rationality was that the human brain has limited resources. It has limited processing speed and limited storage. So you will never be able to process unlimited volumes of information at infinite speeds, right? That's very intuitive to most of us, and he was able to sort of put rigor around that idea, and he called it bounded rationality, mm -hmm. meaning we have ordinary and systematic bounds, constraints, on how fully rational we're gonna be. We don't price shop indefinitely. We probably could find one more store that would make it cheaper, but at some point we say, I got it. I'm just, even if it would be worth my time to go to one more store, I'm not going to. That's an example of bounded rationality. Bounded ethicality was us taking that same idea, Max Bezerman, Mazarin Banaji, and I, and applying it to our ethical behavior. Mm -hmm. And here, it's a little more counterintuitive because what we want to believe, the world we want to believe in, is one of unicorns, mm -hmm. where there's loveliness and perfection and elegance, and there are good people who are good all the time. That's what we want to believe. Mm -hmm. There are no unicorns, and there is no unbounded ethicality. None of us, no matter how good we are, are perfectly ethical all the time. Mm -hmm. And if we recall the system one and system two thinking, the fast and automatic versus slow and deliberative, particularly when we're in fast and automatic mode, there's elements of our uh, mind that we don't even realize are influencing our decisions. Mm -hmm. So bounded ethicality refers to those psychological processes. Systematic, ordinary, all of us possess bounded ethicality psychological processes that limit the perfection in how ethical we are and how ethical we are compared to how ethical we want to be and see ourselves as being. Mm. That's the crazy part. Yeah. We all think we're more ethical than our behavior would suggest to a third party. And how does that affect organizations? Yeah. How, how is that good for leaders to be aware of or Absolutely. individual workers. Absolutely. Again, Max Bazerman, Mazarin Banaji, and I, uh, we thought hard about that. And we put together a Harvard Business Review article called How Unethical Are You? Where we actually, <laughs> I, I know, because it just sort of captures <laughs> it. it. We came up with actually four really central issues that organizations face. Um, one of them was conflicts of interest that we, we tend to believe that our professionalism will protect us from being biased. So mm. uh, if I'm a senior leader trying to decide who to put into a fast track program, and I came out of marketing, and I'm considering candidates from marketing, finance, accounting, manufacturing, I want to believe that it doesn't matter where I came from, that I can be impartial. But all the evidence suggests we are influenced by our conflicts of interest. Mm. Supreme Court justices, doctors, 
all of us, we claim professionalism, but the truth is we're human and our bounded ethicality means conflicts of interest are real. That's one example. Mm. Another might be, um, this is one of my favorites, overclaiming credit. <laughs> that um, there's some great study, one of my favorites by Nick Epley, Eugene Caruso, and Max Biesterman. And what they did was they went to academics who co-author articles together. So when we publish in journals, there's often two or three or four of us. And they did a survey asking these teams, how much did you contribute to this project, this paper that was published? And they asked each person individually, and then they added up those percents for each team. <laughs> the average sum was 139 <laughs> percent. Surprised it was only that far. Only over. that much, right? <laughs> and there's been similar studies. There was actually a classic study that asked husband and wives to do a similar thing. And oh, again, we yeah. see a number well over 100 <laughs> percent. And so what's so interesting is for each person, they actually are speaking from a place that feels like truth to them. So perhaps uh, the, the person who put a lot of the writing into a project is valuing the writing as mm. the most significant part. So that's why I contributed 75%. Yeah. But perhaps the person who did the analysis views the data as the central piece of this project. And so for them, they contributed 75%. <laughs> and we can see how our mind brings us to the mm. conclusion that favors our own interests. That's overclaiming bias. And then the piece that my work tends to um, focus most on is unconscious bias. Unconscious bias is again something that it's not specific to certain individuals. We all carry unconscious biases. These are associations we have between uh, concepts that we're not even aware we have. It happens like lightning fast, mm -hmm. millisecond fast. We literally measure it in milliseconds. If we were to think slowly, I probably wouldn't make any association between uh, white people, black people, and more intelligent or less intelligent. But on a lightning fast test that is called the implicit association test that Tony Greenwald, Brian Nosek, and Mazreen Banaji have made widespread and rigorous in psychology, on this test we see time and time again that 75% of people in a split second environment are more lo likely to associate positive things with white people and negative things with black people. Mm. That's called an implicit bias or an unconscious bias. On a conscious level, a system two level, that's not what people report. Hmm. This is an unconscious automatic bias. Is it socialization? Is it a cultural? Thing? Yes, and in fact we see, because the IAT has been administered in a lot of different countries and different cultures where, you know, in this country, race is the charged issue. In other countries, it might be religion, it mm -hmm. might be skin color, skin tone. Mm -hmm. um, and so the IATs are different in each country to reflect oh, wow. what's the cultural issue there. Mm -hmm. And I like to think of it as fog or rain. It's when you're in rain and fog, you don't even realize how it's permeating all of you. Mm -hmm. The culture we're raised in from infancy on is that rain and fog. We're forming associations all the time as to mm. what's good and what's bad, just from what's being fed to us in the environment around us. Let's stick with the white, black, the race IAT example. It isn't just whites who show that implicit bias favoring whites. We see approximately half of blacks mm. showing that association as well. Mm. So the rain and fog surrounds all of us. Right. Being a member of a group doesn't necessarily protect us from it. Mm. Women yeah. show an implicit bias associating men with math right. versus associating women with math, mm. despite on a conscious level not necessarily believing that to be true. Mm. So this rain and fog is just so permeating and so powerful despite our conscious system two intentions. Dolly, how can organizations best structure themselves to encourage collaboration? Yeah. You know, I think that comes from the top. You know, I've seen organizations try to put the informal incentives in place and they reorganize to create different structures and matrices and all of that is important. I, it is important that we have alignment in all the formal structures, in the incentives, et cetera. But the fact of the matter is, if the senior people are not collaborating, everyone knows mm. that isn't what's valued. And I really think that's what it comes down to, mm. is being able to look and see, hmm, 
is the chief marketing officer and the chief technology officer at odds with each other? And are we basically part of this game, this tug of war? Or are they really trying to figure this out? Hmm. And from there, it sets the tone for everyone else. So it's not to say all the other pieces aren't important, but they're necessary, not sufficient. It's leadership by seeing, not do as I say, right. but not exactly. as I do. Exactly, <laughs> that's right, that's okay. right. If our senior leaders aren't collaborating, no one else is going to. You've conducted research that shows that professors and PhD programs yeah. are much more apt to be responsive to white males mm -hmm over females and minorities right. um, for prospects for PhD programs, um, right. especially in the higher paying fields, engineering or STEM related right. things. Talk a little bit about your findings and how it actually affects education and the corporate world organizations. Right. We conducted what we call an audit study. So an audit study is when you want to study a real world phenomena and there's really no way to do it in a controlled laboratory environment. Mm. But you still want the control of being able to, to change certain things and keep certain things consistent for everybody. So what we did was we created an experiment in the real world. Mm. We created a database of professors, of over 6,000 professors, one from each PhD granting department in the U.S. based wow. off of U.S. News and World Reports top 260 universities, um, I think excluding uh, two that were not on the mainland of the U.S. And we sent an email to each of those professors. The email was identical. The only difference was who sent the email. The name of the sender of this email wow. was either uh, male or female and uh, white, black, Indian, Chinese, or Hispanic sounding. Mm. So we pre-tested these names, ensured that in a separate sample, people said, I believe this, believe this name to represent a female Hispanic, or, mm -hmm. and sent these emails out requesting for more information about applying to a PhD program. What we were interested in is seeing uh, the responses to these emails and whether the request for help was met with, was actually responded to with an email and whether the um, they were willing to help. And as you so nicely summarized, uh, we compared our white male group to all others combined. That's how we designed our study. So we had white males versus non-white males. And we did find that white males were more likely to get a response than the mm -hmm. non-white males. And it was particularly true actually rather painfully, this is um, the segment where it was most true, that effect, the effect was largest, was in the discipline of business. Hmm. All three of my co-authors, Madupe Akinola at the Columbia Business School and Katie Milkman at Wharton, all three of us work in business schools. Right. <laughs> we did this across all disciplines, art history, social work, everything. Wow. Business came out as the most biased, and private universities were more biased than public mm. universities. All three of us work at private universities. <laughs> so this was a little bit of a, oh, that, yeah. that wasn't what we were quite going for. Um, but it was a good reminder to us that we need to pay attention to our own environments. We work with colleagues who are so committed to egalitarian environments and to the value of creating a level playing field so committed to that. And yet to see this response suggests, this set of findings suggests that this isn't a conscious, intentional hmm. um, difference we're seeing. We don't have the data in this kind of, you know, we're just getting emails, so we don't know what people's conscious or unconscious was doing. But to us, we are um, hypothesizing that what we're seeing is a reflection of unconscious bias, not hmm. conscious bias. And I think the implication it has for education and for business is it points us to what I like to call pathway behaviors in addition to gateway. What's the difference? Gateway decisions and behaviors are those big ones like the, the hiring of a person, the admission of a person to a university, the, the sort of very formal, there's an application, there's a law that dictates what should happen. This is a structured situation. 
Those are gateway decisions. In the United States, we've made tremendous progress. We're not done, but we've made tremendous progress in the last 10, 20, 50 years on improving gateway processes. Pathway processes, pathway behaviors, are these micro moments. Mm. They're these little informal things that just happen along the pathway, like whether an email is responded to. Mm. We don't know when an email isn't responded to what it means. Did they ever get the email? Were they on vacation? Did I send it to the wrong person? Am I not a good enough candidate? We don't know. It's just a little micro moment. Hmm. There's no le law that says every email must be responded to. <laughs> I know I can't keep up with my inbox. <laughs> but cumulative patterns with pathway behaviors, whether they be things like emails or nonverbal behaviors or who gets listened to in a meeting, who gets cut off when they're speaking, whose mm. advice gets taken seriously, these are little pathway moments right. that cumulatively can make a difference yeah. in an academic career and in a corporate career. Mm. There's a theory in sociology called cumulative disadvantage and how over time this can add up to really serious implications for a career. And I think what, path, what our study does is illustrate where some of these pathway moments are taking place. Mm. In my field of academia, there is a formal admissions process. You don't need to informally email a professor to get into a PhD program. That's definitely a pathway moment. It's not a gateway. But you know what? Those emails do make a difference. Mm. If a professor recognizes your name, it could make a difference. Right. And so pathways can affect gateways mm. in the end. And I think that's what I hope our study helps us notice is We've made progress on the gateways. We've got more work to do on the pathways. And I'm not even sure what that looks like, but I think us just starting to look and pay attention, because mm. that's where the unconscious bias is going to really right. have an effect, is all that pathway stuff. And those nuanced pathway moments can really affect the individual. Yes. And their level of confidence or feeling of competence. Absolutely. Or, and this, the work on self-fulfilling prophecy says mm. it can even affect our performance. Once mm. it affects our confidence, it can actually affect our performance. Right. Then we perform at less than our capability, and then others don't see our capability, and then we don't get the job, and mm. then, and so on. Mm. Absolutely, and it Important. also affects, there's great research showing how it affects our physiology. Mm. The stress level, particularly in moments of uncertainty. For example, if you don't know if you've just been a victim of bias or not, if a black person doesn't know, and in that moment of ambiguity is grappling with what just happened, was, was that racist or wasn't it? It wasn't clear. Mm. That has a huge impact on stress levels. It's actually less stressful physiologically to have a moment of apparent racism mm. as opposed to um, ambiguous racism. It's really important physiologically to manage the stress that comes in these moments, particularly mm. of unconscious bias. You recently spoke in the media about Reddit CEO mm -hmm. Ellen Peo's decision to ban all of negotiations yes. to address gender biases in organizations. Tell me yes. what your POV is on that. What I loved about that decision was that it was really bold. Mm. It, it was bold, it was unprecedented. It was also an experiment. And my point of view was it's a bold experiment and like with all experiments, what we should be doing is paying attention to what happens next, learning from the experiment. I would also like to see other bold experiments. So bold experiment where we ban negotiations, bold experiment where we mandate negotiations. Let's compare what are the salary outcomes and career outcomes. What does the gender gap look like over time for those individuals as they go through their careers? Then we'll know more, not even over their careers. At that moment, what do we see? Do we get the talent we want or don't we? Do we have a harder time? Do our number of resumes being submitted drop when we announce that we're banning negotiations? Or do they go up? Do mm. more women apply when we make that? Oh, These, wow, this is yeah. what I mean by let's get data. Let's, if we're going to run an experiment, let's run it, but then let's not guess at whether it works. Let's do everything we can to understand what were the 
consequences unintended and otherwise of the decision. But I commended, it's unfortunate she's not CEO there anymore, so I don't know what's going to happen if that right. bold experiment is still being carried out and yeah. if, in fact, it will be treated as something we want to track data on. But I would encourage more CEOs to, to make these kind of bold moves and it's okay to learn as we go. Mm. It's not okay not to do anything. What do you think we can do in our education system to teach girls mm. at a much younger stage yeah. um, how to negotiate and that they can negotiate yes. and how to deal with the repercussions, the gender-based repercussions of, of that? I have two daughters, ages mm. 10 and 9, and so I think about this question a lot. And here's the challenge. Our schools are just as gendered as our society is. Mm. Um, you know, my children have wonderful teachers, but, you know, sometimes they come home and they say, we played this great game in class, and the boys, if you, they won a prize, they got a toy car, and if the girls won a prize, they got lip balm. Mm -hmm. And they said, but I wanted the car, not the <laughs> lip balm. But the teacher said I had to take the lip balm because I was a girl. Oh my gosh. Those moments are gendered moments. They're unnecessary gendering. Yeah. There's no reason why we can't give the kids the choice. Or boys need lip balm too. Yeah. Their, their lips get chapped in the winter. <laughs> um, that's one story that illustrates what happens in every school mm -hmm. in this country, quite frankly. Um, we are very gendered as a society and it's reflected in how we educate our children. I find in my home we are trying to undo that gendering constantly really? with our kids because the messages they're getting from their, the TV shows they watch, mm -hmm. the video games they play, at school the number of things that are split into boys will go here and girls will go there mm. or let's hear from the girls first okay now let's hear from the boys in on issues that have nothing to do where this is not about the human body this, there is no reason mm. for there to be a gendering we're trying to undo that all the time at wow. home and we're trying to very openly point it out when we see it so much so that I I find my kids, I think they're parroting me to some extent just to get praise, but hey, I'll take it. <laughs> Maybe someday it'll actually mean something. But I see them, you know, that we'll get entertainment weekly and there'll be a cover that'll show a man looking very powerful and a woman looking very frail and mm -hmm. sexy. And they'll say, well, why doesn't she have any clothes on? He has mm. clothes on. Mommy, does she go on TV with no clothes on? No, no, she's dressed when she's on TV. <laughs> That's just to sell magazines. At least partially. <laughs> yeah, exactly, at least partially. <laughs> I think your question was, how do we help educate our kids to our girls to negotiate better? And I think it helps by us loosening up these gender norms mm. because I think it's all connected. Yeah. Our girls very quickly figure out that what they're expected to do is be quieter and be better behaved and the boys get away with being more assertive and being louder because that's how boys are. That's what they're told from when they're toddlers. Mm. That's how parents talk in play groups. Hmm. Oh, you have girls, oh, you're so lucky. Oh, wow. All the time. Yeah. Oh, I have boys, let me tell you. <sighs> and so that, our kids hear it and they come to understand that good girls act a certain way. Mm -hmm. And that means they don't make waves, they don't ask for things, and they don't negotiate. Talk to us about the primary concepts of negotiation. You mm. teach this to your students. Yes. What do you tell them? Yes. I draw upon the wisdom of amazing negotiation scholars in this field, and my goal is just to translate it and distill it for my students. Um, Basically, there's two things I want them to leave my course with. I want them, number one, to be thinking about not just what the other person wants, but why they want it. Hmm. Because you can't always give someone what they want, but if you know why they want it, you may be able to figure out another way to satisfy that need. So we push a lot on how to get to the why. What is motivating the person to ask? If they're asking for more money, why? Is it because they want to feel valued? Is it because they have student loans? Is it because they have a spouse at home who doesn't think it's worth relocating? If the offer, There are different ways to approach every one of those scenarios. So getting to the why underneath the what is the number one learning of the course. The number two learning is trying to get to how much somebody wants what they want when we negotiate with them. 
every issue was not a high priority. Mm. Okay, so now I know what you want, now I know why you want it, and there's eight things that are on the table, but how much do you want each thing? How mm. important is it to you? If I can deliver on one thing only, what would it be? And then let me go to bat for that. Let me not go to bat for the thing that was your eighth least important issue. Um, my husband and I, you know, we are both strong-minded people. We both have our own opinions on things, but we don't actually fight a ton. And I think one of the secrets is we use this one to 10 scale. An issue we disagree on, we say one to 10, how important is it? We each throw our number out. And if the number is eight or below, the person with the higher number wins. Huh. If it's a nine or a 10, we talk it out. Because that means it's something really important. And if we're both at a nine or a 10, this is like, okay, let's sit down. Yeah. Like this is worth hashing out. But if we're talking about what movie we want to see or how we want to spend the weekend or where to go for vacation or how to handle a certain behavioral issue with our kids, and one of us is, is like, it's really important, it's an eight to me that we follow through on what we said we were gonna do. And the other person is like, I don't know. I, I mean, I thought it seemed like a good idea that we listen to what she's asking for, but it's just a four for me. If you don't think it's that important, if you think we have to stick to our guns and it's an eight, then it's an eight. Hmm. Let's go, we don't have to discuss it. And so we eliminate a lot of discussion with that alone. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, you have to not use your nines and tens too often. I, at the beginning of the marriage, I was using, I was overusing the nines and tens. That doesn't last for long. Is that a sustainable strategy? Speaking of marriage, yeah. you did a study on marriage structure. Yes. And how it affects the workplace. Yes. Which is something I think is such an interesting connection that people tend to overlook. Yes. So it's seems like you found that men who were in traditional marriages right. versus more modern right. structured marriages tended to not favor women were at right. the workplace or promoting women or feeling like they were productive leaders. Right. Tell yes. me a little bit about these findings yes. and how it impacts Women in the workplace. Yes. So this is work I've done with Sridhar Desai at the University of North Carolina and Art Brief, who's at the University of Utah. And it's exactly as you framed it. We really were resisting this notion that you can truly separate the home and the work mm -hmm. and sort of the psychology you carry back and forth. I know my same heart and mind goes with me to both places. Yeah. And we were speculating that that's gotta be a challenge. If you're a man in the 21st century in the United States, and in the workplace we're talking a lot about the gender gap and level playing field and egalitarian, and at the same time, for personal reasons that are incredibly valid, in your own home you've chosen to have a gendered division of labor. And the gender division of labor reflects traditional gender roles where the man is doing the more status attaining activity, mm -hmm. making money, working outside the home, and the woman is doing the work that traditionally is viewed as lower status in our society, mm -hmm. raising the children, maintaining the home. And in that setting, it seemed to me and my co-authors that it would be very challenging for that husband to navigate, to code switch mm. between these two environments. Like it almost seems psychologically impossible. Right. So we were curious, is, can they, do they? So what we did, you can't, uh, unfortunately it's a little tricky, you can't randomly assign people to either a traditional marriage or a modern <laughs> marriage. <laughs> this turns out that that's a little outside the scope of a lab study. <laughs> so there's no perfect way to study this. And knowing that, what we wanted to do was look at it from a lot of different angles and run this research question through different tests and see if we come out with the same outcome no matter how we look at it. Mm. So we ran um, studies in the laboratory where we simply um, asked people uh, who were in traditional marriages to consider different kinds of workplaces, some with women and some with not with women and saw how they reacted. We looked at survey data that's been done in both the United States and in Great Britain that's been done over time and we compared how men in traditional marriages responded versus men in non-traditional marriages. Yes. We conducted surveys of our own. 
So together we put together five studies and we found, as you summarized, that men in traditional marriages were more likely to have a negative attitude towards women in the workplace. On first blush, that doesn't strike people as counterintuitive. So, well, that sort of makes sense because if I'm a man in a traditional marriage, I've shaped my home to reflect my values. My wife and I have shaped my home and that those same values would, would carry into the workplace. That seems logical. But here's the crazy part. Our longitudinal data suggest that change happened after marriage, not before. Hmm. So it wasn't that we went into the marriage that reflected our values that we then took into the workplace. There was something about living in the gender division of labor at home that shaped our values that we took into the workplace. Mm. That's what we think we see in this longitudinal data. That's a more complicated story, yeah. and it's harder to think about what advice to give because, of course, our home lives are our own and should reflect what works best for our families, and every family mm -hmm. has their own needs. Um, and at the same time, that kind of code switching, if it's that hard, we've got to figure out as an organization how to make it easier. Mm -hmm. And so I think the takeaway for organizations of a study like ours is to think about, to understand that these are human beings that come into our workplace that we say, okay, gender gap, let's all be egalitarian now. And it's not as easy as flipping a switch. Mm. Everyone's trying, but we gotta realize we're all bringing in both conscious and unconscious associations mm. that could be affecting how we operate in that environment. So the more we can sort of nudge and inspire and prime and leverage all the so social psychological research out there to create an environment that leads to the more egalitarian outcome as opposed to just hoping we can will ourselves into mm. code switching more perfectly. Again, mm. bounded at the cality, none of us are perfect. We're all trying our best. What is implicit social cognition mm -hmm. and how can it affect management? Social cognition describes the mental processes that affect how we see people. So it's our cognition, our thinking about people, that's the social part. Implicit social cognition is the elements of our mind, those processes that are the automatic version of social cognition. So how I'm perceiving people through those unconscious biases, for example, represents implicit social cognition. So it's a broad category that a academics use to include a whole bunch of psychological processes. So implicit attitudes, implicit stereotypes, implicit identity, they would all fall under implicit social cognition. The implications for managers is that there's so much um, we do as managers that is explicitly tied to this work of understanding people mm -hmm. and being able to accurately perceive them. So for example, if I as a manager can accurately gauge when someone is angry or not, I can more appropriately respond when I'm giving them feedback, right? Well, but it turns out, due to our unconscious biases, we're more likely, the average person in the United States is more likely to perceive a black person as being angry hmm. than a white person. Wow. So imagine as a manager in that situation, if I'm more, the threshold for perceiving anger in a black person is lower than the mm -hmm. threshold for perceiving anger in a white person, I may misread the situation I'm in. My social cognition on an automatic or implicit level may lead me to misunderstand the reaction I'm getting mm. and take us down a path that's less productive than if I had accurately read it. So many people are talking about, you know, the millennial generation yes. or the people, young people who are growing up with more technology as yes. having less emotional intelligence. Yes. Yes. How might that play into these? No, it's a really important question. I, I don't do research on that question, but I sure am glad people are thinking about it and looking at it. And I think about my own kids as being affected by this phenomena. There is research that isn't specific to millennials, but looks at the medium, the media, uh, like email, that are not rich in contextual clues. Mm. You know, that's very yeah, static. It's so difficult. It's so <laughs> difficult. And they find, for example, that humor 
trying to be funny on email is often misunderstood. Really? Yes. It's the most dangerous medium to try to be funny in. Oh. I've actually, once I read this research, I, I, <laughs> I really tempered any attempt. I mean, not Good that I, know. I was never particularly funny on email to begin with, but I think I'm even <laughs> less funny now. And, but it, especially humor that is um, like sarcastic humor yeah. often falls into that category. Um, so part of it may be millennials who aren't getting enough practice reading real people's social cues, but part of it also might be that we're relying so much on very flat forms of communication where you can't convey social cues. So there may be some combination here. Well, Dolly, thank you so much for being here with thank us today. You. We really appreciate all of your insight and your research and your wisdom. And I appreciate all you're doing to help us all be better learners. Thank you for that. Thanks for joining us at Sarder TV. I'm Jennifer Crumpton, and we'll see you next time.